Mm -hmm. but I'm not reading. Are we ready? Yes. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Not very well. Can you hear me now? Um, can I ask if you have a cell phone that you turn it to mute or whatever you do with cell phones? So I really appreciate... I really appreciate you all joining me tonight because this presentation weaves together so many things that I love. So it's, it's always really fun for me to be able to share um, with the Oaknoll, with my Oaknoll family, things that I love. And you all know me as the social worker here, but I've been an organic farmer and that kind of launched a real love for the earth and the environment and a real interest in you know, protecting and, and activism there. Um, I was a preschool teacher, so I taught school, three, four, and five-year-olds, and I'm also an artist. And so tonight's presentation weaves together all of those things in a really interesting way. Um, the other thing that I love is when I get friends together. So I've got some new friends and some old friends meeting my new and old friends. Um, we have David Gould from the University of Iowa, the Bell and Blank Gifted and Talented Program. And we also have Trisha Winchill, who is the director and also the lead teacher at Prusel Preschool which is the preschool that's connected with the Prusel School of Music. Um, I wrote a big, long introduction that shares with you all of their accomplishments, and believe me, they're very accomplished. But for me, tonight's um, presentation and conversation is not about experts telling all of us what they did and what we should do. It's really just a community of people coming together to talk about something that we all rely on and um, love, which is our, our planet, which is our world. So um, just help me welcome David and Trisha to Open All. Hi, I'm Dave, and uh, and I'll let Tricia hold. We're we're sharing the mic tonight, so uh, it'll go back and forth. But but I want to say I'm really honored to be here. Uh, number one, I have a couple of old friends um, in the crowd that I did, it was a surprise I didn't expect to see, and um, and this is um, this is a a special place. Uh, if you guys uh, know Lindsay Reed, uh, who's here. She was, uh, I can take no credit for all the wonderful things she's doing now, but she was a student of mine uh, years and years ago. And, um, and we, my, I brought my students to Oakno, and we did a project here uh, a number of years ago, uh, which was really wonderful, where my students got to know the residents and work with them. So this is a, a special place. Uh, what we're going to do tonight, uh, Trish, uh, I'll let her introduce herself in a second, but. Um, but well, we're neighbors, uh, we're dear friends, and, and like Sarah, we care deeply about the planet. Both of our interests have come from our students, um, and we're gonna tell a couple of stories about what brought us here tonight and what we hope you'll add your voices to as time goes on. Um, but what I'd like to do is have you think about a couple of questions, and these are questions, these are questions that I, um, I ask my students. The first one, is to recall a meaningful experience in the natural world. Um, you know, you, you don't have to, just to, let me know when you, when you have one in your mind, a time when you were in nature, a time when something very special happened. And, and Trish, I'm gonna put you on the spot, and I'm gonna let you give us an example. Okay, I wasn't prepared for this, but very recently, my daughter spent uh, semester in Hawaii, and this was after she kind of struggled when she first went to college, and she went to college and came home, and then felt a lot better. She ended up in Hawaii and invited us out to, to visit her, 
And it was so good to see her thriving in um, an environment that was just meant for her. Everything was beautiful. Has anybody been to Hawaii? It was my first time and it was so beautiful. I kept thinking, this is better than a postcard. This is the real thing and it was um, more beautiful than I could have imagined. And um, we went into, a, we went on a trail with waterfalls and these amazing um, trees and vines and everything around us. And it was just awe-inspiring to be in this, in the ocean, the ocean was so blue, to be in the most beautiful space on, that I had ever been on the planet. But the best thing about it was that I was with my daughter, Elkie, and she was smiling and she was happy after having struggled a bit. And, and so it was, but it wouldn't have been the same if she had just been in my home smiling and happy. It was where we were and she was in her element and I was there with her. Um, so that, that was really meaningful. And I can, I can see the greens in my mind and I can see the shapes of some of those leaves, um, shapes of leaves I had never seen before, um, roots along the ground that we had to be careful and walk over and the color of the ocean. I did not know it could be that color. Um, so that's mine. That's a beautiful one. Does everyone have one? Um, a colleague of mine has this wonderful line, and, and I'm sure if you watch the news enough, you see the dire statistics on all the problems our planet faces. But what he believes is that, um, you know, in order to save the world, we're going to put our money on beauty, to understand the beauty of the world, to help it. Um, a, a question that I also ask my students, which is a little harder, um, is has there, has there ever been a time you feared for your future? And, uh, you know, I will tell you that um, there's a lot of anxiety at the universities and colleges among young adults as they look at the world that they're inheriting. Um, this isn't the first time, though, and I'm sure, and I'd like you to think a little bit from your own histories. I mean, number one, we just came through the pandemic. And that was one that I think uh, the idea of what that would look like when we would get out was probably very fearful for a lot of people. But when I think of, I think of other things, I think of war, I think of, I think of recessions, I think of other opportunities when our future, um, our future didn't seem totally in our hands. And, um, and so I would just like you to take a moment to think a little bit about that. Um, I'm gonna tell you a story and uh, and this is where it begins. This is a student of mine. Her name is Shannon Nolan. And Shannon Nolan is exactly the type of uh, person I just described who, this was her senior year in college. She was getting ready to graduate. And, um, and she was very, I would almost argue, upset over the world that she was happy to enter. Uh, she was uh, facing a recession, she was having tough job prospects, and she, as you see the sign, this is her talking to uh, her classmates. While our generation did not necessarily create these problems, we will be the ones charged with finding their solutions. Um, she took it upon herself, uh, she organized her classmates, and um, initially, what she, what she had in mind was to put some kind of movement together some kind of thing that she could do. Uh, and I will show you, this may be a familiar, a familiar face to you, but this is uh, Amanda Gorman. Did any of you guys see the, um, see the inauguration? Uh, so I met Amanda Gorman and became friends with her when she was 17 years old, and she was a uh, incoming freshman at Harvard University. Uh, she had also just become the inaugural Youth Poet Laureate. And do you, do you know, a, 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 there's always been, at least as long as I can remember, a Poet Laureate. And for those of you who aren't quite familiar with that, a Poet Laureate, uh, the way I would describe it, they all take the position a little differently, but it's, it's kind of a, a poet who, who, in a way, tries to articulate a voice for the country. Um, through their poetry, through their work, uh, they travel the country and they, they use it to have a term and then they, they get another one. Um, but, but on the wisdom, they decided that, um, that we would have a youth poet laureate. Um, and Amanda was the one selected. And Shannon's idea was that to, to put a voice 
to, to the, the work that she wanted to, to her generation, that we would reach out to Amanda and we would ask Amanda to put a charge to the generation to begin to raise their voices on behalf of the planet. And that's where, that's where this started. Um, what we did is Shannon then took Amanda's charge and she began to go through the university, high school, colleges, uh, across the state and then as far as, the, as Oregon and as far as New York and began to have people creating pieces of art, uh, writing, um, as you can tell, uh, she would bring this cart and there would be all kinds of, of crafts and different ways to express it. But the idea was that if you were to speak on behalf of the planet, if you would add your voice, um, if you could speak for the planet to the people, what would you say? And that's where this began. Um, I'm going to show you a little video, and hopefully, uh, if it's not loud enough, I'll back it up and, and give it another try. But, um, but this is a video that we made um, in kind of uh, as a way to share the story. Uh, this, the voice you'll hear is Shannon's. Um, this was largely done, and what you will see when you, you see these students, these are different students who uh, are showing their prompt for the planet uh, kind of pieces of art. So let's give this a try. Voices in conversation around the world's most pressing issues. With the powerful words of the first ever Youth Poet Laureate, Amanda Gorman, we spread a prompt far and wide for young people to lend their voices to in hopes that together we will create a better tomorrow. We are asking young people around the world to think of one element and speak in its voice through pictures and words. What would fires raging in California say to the world? What would the wind from Hurricane Maria demolishing Puerto Rico sound like? What does freshly fallen rain on a state in drought feel and taste like through poetry, love, relief? Think of it as creating an open letter from the planet. The last few months have been spent creating art and conversation. We've collected responses from young people from college students to preschoolers, and from Illinois to Oregon. We've held workshops at high schools during English classes and at night in university residence halls, asking participants to find their empathy and use their passion to speak out about an issue that lives in their heart. Submissions range from poems to crafted tiles, to videos, to business models, to pictures, and to sculptures. While each different, they all share a similar hope, to understand what is worth fighting for. To create great change in our communities and on a global scale, we must now put these voices into action. We are the rising change makers. We may not have created these problems, but we will be the ones charged with finding their solutions. So now, we must join together, united against the issues that keep us up at night, determined to work together towards a more sustainable existence and a better future for all. The stakes have never been higher. The time is now. We are the future. It brings back a lot of memories. The students you saw sitting along, uh, sitting along the uh, the Iowa City there in the walkway were my students, my class. And um, uh, if, I, 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 if we have time, I'll tell you the wonderful things they are all doing now. Um, I'm going to show you just a couple of examples, and then I'm going to let uh, Trish come in and share her piece of the story. But this was one done by one of my students. You probably can't read it. But this is in response to the hurricane that hit Puerto Rico. And uh, uh, this is what, uh, what one student made his response to that. These were, uh, the next ones uh, are both from high school students. And as you can see, um, you know, uh, these were things that they ripped from magazines and pieced together and wrote. Uh, if you don't plan on leaving me, you might uh, want to start paying attention to me. And that's the earth speaking. And every day, is the difference between life and death, so why do you uh, pour me out uh, by the bucket? And it's water that it's talking there. Um, I'll, I'll pass over to Trish and let her tell you a little bit about how my group of students connected with hers. Yeah, so we'll need the next slide. 
So while Dave and Shannon were doing this incredible work with college students and high school students across the country, um, I was working with a very different, entirely different population. A population that has no trouble springing out of bed in the morning, often hours before their parents, a generation full of innocence and joy and hope and important ideas of their own. And when I saw the Prompt for the Planet come across my Facebook one morning in the spring of 2018, I thought this was an, an amazing project, um, but I thought that young children might have something to add to it as well. So I searched for the contact information of the project, hoping that whoever it was that was doing this amazing thing would consider the voices of young children as well. And when I got to the contact information, I was surprised and delighted to find my neighbor and friend's uh, name, Dave, at the, the other side of that email, and I was so glad that it was you. Um, so Dave connected me with Shannon, and Shannon came to Brussels Preschool to work with young children on this project. It was very exciting the day she came out. We love visitors. We get special things when visitors come, and on this day we got hot cocoa. So this is our hot cocoa meeting with Shannon, um, where she told us about her project, and she asked these young children if they would help her. And of course they said yes, and they very excitedly got to work. And um, Shannon left, and they were working, 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 and then they did what all kids do. What's the question that all kids ask a million times? Why? Why are we doing this? Why did Shannon come and want us to do this? Um, I guess we failed to include that part in our COCO meeting. So we got on our email and we asked Shannon why. And Shannon responded, because words are powerful and you can share your powerful voice with things that don't have them. So that was enough for the kids. My voice is powerful became the rallying call for this project with these preschoolers. And they got to work. Next slide. They shared their voices with the earth and they created art to go along. Um, they even made a song called, because we are the Prusa School of Music, so we created our very own song called Listen to the Earth. Um, and here are just a couple of examples of what they did. This is the rainbow up on top, and this little guy used old maps to make a very busy city. All these people, you can imagine the people running around in those subways and on the streets. And the rainbow says to those people, stop and sit back and take a rest and look up at me. And that's from the rainbow. Over here is the grass along the edge and the sun is shining down on the grass. And those are Isla's feet. But the grass says to Isla, I'm scared of your foot because the weight is so strong. Please step gently on me, said the grass. So we created, oh, probably 50, we had about 50 students. We created 50 responses. And Shannon came out one more time to visit us and collect our work and take it to the next phase, which was the event. So Shannon was a senior and was getting ready to graduate. And we wanted to have some way to launch her big idea. And so what we did is, well, we first, uh, first got a hold of the media. And uh, they, it was a series of articles, students sounding call to action with out of class experiences. And, and not only did my students do the prompt for the planet, the prompt uh, piece of artwork, but each of them took an issue in the world that they cared about and spent and connected with a community nonprofit and worked on it. Um, and so the, the media started paying attention. And then we needed to promote our event. And this was the, this was the uh, it's a little busy with the words, but this was the, um, the poster that we came up with. And uh, you could see the prompt for the planet and the community people that were involved. And, and one of them was an event that we were going to host at the Ingler Theater, um, where we would invite the entire community. We would talk about the issues. We brought a thought leader into our mix. And all of this would be produced and planned by the student. And then, of course, the, uh, the part two was our students being able to share their work. Um, I collaborated with the, uh, the art department, and, um, and what, uh, what uh, these are all student works. 
But what was created were sculptures. These were huge. This, uh, this one here on the left hung from the top of the Engler Theater. Uh, this um, kind of lit up frog of some kind, or I, don't, I guess it's kind of a frog, um, was what we used as a stage with the microphone coming out. This, as you can see, was out on campus, and it was a, kind of a, a, a carcass of a, of a whale. Um, all of these were made from recycled materials, and so the students went out to the landfills, and they and they learned about the waste, they learned about uh, what was happening and, uh, and the destruction, and then they took, um, they took uh, as you can see, the, the bird is stuffed with plastic, and of course, the, you know, those, uh, those eyes are made from milk jugs. And so these were scattered all around our, our community. And, uh, and then, way before uh, Joe Biden got a hold of her, um, Amanda Gorman wrote a poem uh, for us uh, to kind of launch the evening. And if you don't mind, I'll share it with you and let you hear Amanda's take on it. Whoops. The condor, the cuckoo, the crane, the flicker, the flycatcher, the falcon, the owl, spotted, gray, great, the clover, the rail, black, clapper, white-footed, the bald eagle. Almost all and only dust in the long walk of dust was just the God-given names crusted in the pounding temples of dunes. Each a child with their own standard language, a breaching history, a web-footed mystery, winged and weighty in the guts of the earth. Swallowed seagulls shift in the sand, the bodies a flash of white rain, veined, ripe for the breath, caked with death, the falling, the floods, unchecked cigar flex, cigar buds, the black mandible buds inside the throne of the tree stump, or the tree's palm, the palm tree, the palm tree, the psalm tree, the calm tree, we bomb trees, those imports extorted paradise. A treescape of an escape, scraped and spun beside the rigid shapes of neighborhoods. We could be crouching but proud amidst the earth. Made of such brown, we wouldn't be looking down when we should be looking up. At the song of the sea, she sculpted into a mirror for the face of a globe. She glass with a skull heel so tight it's sea glass white, the long stretch of bright of a sunset in all its beckoning and blinding. There's a skinny black girl at the pier over here almost daring to fly, cause she knows the ocean is both a graveyard and a spiritual dancing off the lip. Every word a wound, every word a way. She reaches amidst the crumbs of her pocket and fishes out beads of letters. Cranes her neck at the flicker of the gull, caught in flight, spotted gray, great writing the rails of a bald wind, black, clapper, light-footed. She tosses poetry and arcs above the water like seeds, head thrown back, laughing hard, and waits. Thank you. Well, while my students were inside uh, showing off their work and with to the community, uh, Trisha's students were outside. Whoops. Hi, University. So you remember I told you they wrote a song to go with, with their words. It was called Listen to the Earth. Um, I would sing it for you, but even though I work at Purcell School of Music, I'm not musical. I'm the, I'm the one who gets to play with the kids. Um, but it was great. They worked with their music teacher, and we decided we should share that song with our community, and they thought the best way to do that was to go downtown and sing it as loud as they could. So on the day of the event, we had a flash mob. We met downtown. We had homemade um, flags for Earth Day that we waved and we sang, and we marched um, all the way down the Ped Mall, singing our hearts out and um, hoping that anyone who heard us would listen to not just us, but listen to the earth, because that's what the song was about. 
Um, before we did that, just this slide over here is the event Dave was talking about where they were inside and Shannon had posted their artwork along with the older students and they were so thrilled to go inside and see their artwork. But um, then we sang and we marched and we walked all the way to the Anglert. And at the Anglert, we were met by Dave students. They created this little tunnel for the kids to walk through. They met us, they cheered, they high-fived, they clapped, and really validated that these young citizens of planet Earth had important ideas and an important voice as well. On this day, these two generations merged. So we had this very young generation that was full of innocence and hope, and the generation that Dave works with, that they're feeling a little bit of skepticism and some doubt in their lives. But these generations came together on this day for one purpose, and that was to share their voices with the earth. And then we went inside and we met Dave. There's Dave with all the kids around him. Um, they kind of swarmed him. He was kind of a hero that day for us. Um, he let them come up on the stage where that plastic animal was that he had showed you. And he talked to them about the other sculptures that you had just seen in the previous slide. And they, they were able to touch it. He answered their questions. And I didn't know it at the time, but something was happening in those young hearts and minds as they gazed at those sea turtles with plastic in their bellies and the birds and, and the animals that had, had plastic. And um, yeah, they, some, they were really taking something in. Because when we returned to school, on Monday, out of the blue, I didn't start this, I noticed little signs like this on our wall. They took it upon themselves to make these signs. These are, it's hard to tell, kids' drawings, I know. This is a cup and it has a straw in it. This is a turtle. There's a cross through that. They didn't want people using these straws or plastic bags that might end up in our ocean. So they started hanging these signs up in our school. That's a straw. And I guess somebody was worried about tigers too. <laughs> no plastic bags. And one day, I will introduce you to Lucas next. One day, this is Lucas. He came out of the art room with this sign that he had put on his back. And it's hard to see the sign. It's upside down on his body, but it's another cup with a straw coming out, crossed out. And he said, Trisha, I got it. I know what I need to do. I put this sign on my back, and everybody following me will see my message, and they will tell someone, and they will tell someone, and they will tell, and they will tell, and they will tell, and, they will tell, and that will be the end. So. We started telling. We told then Mayor Jim Throgmorton about plastic. We told people on the sidewalks in Iowa City and at the farmer's market. We went to a city council meeting. We talked to business owners. We even told the local news about how plastic can hurt animals and asking people to use less of it. So they did it all. They told everybody. And they worked really hard, and people listened. And some restaurants changed the way they were giving out plastic and using plastic. Um, so towards the end of the summer, I thought, wow, we had done a great job. These kids are amazing, right? And Lucas, my little friend Lucas, who wore the sign that first day, he came to me and he said, Trisha, now that the plastic project is done, and I interrupted him, said, Lucas, how do you know it's done? And he said, because people are listening, people are changing, it's done. And I said, okay. And he said, so now that that's done, I know what our next job is. And then he told me about the news story he had seen on TV. And his expression changed, and he got very serious and very grave. And the news story he had seen was much more serious than plastic straws. It had to do with kids at our border. And he wanted to fix that problem. And he believed that he could fix that problem. And he believed he could do it because somebody named Shannon told him that his voice is powerful. 
and people had listened to his voice. So I took Lucas and I gave him a hug and I said, we're gonna leave that problem for the grown-ups to fix. But it was at that moment that I knew I needed to take that sign off Lucas's back and put it on mine. Lucas was four. It's not Lucas's job to fix these problems of the world. That's my job and your job and Dave's job and Sarah's job. And so I created an organization called the Lena Project. Um, that little turtle on our world was drawn by one of the preschoolers and, and the little girl's name was Lena. So we put Lena's name on the turtle and it became forever known as Lena Turtle. So the Lena Project, L stands for less, please use less. E stands for empower, we want to empower voices. N is to notice, notice all the things that, that you can do, all the little things. And A is then to act, do those little things. So I created the Lena Project to carry on the mission of Lucas and his friends. For that summer, they had set out to make the earth a better earth. And now the Lena Project is teaming up with Dave and Prompt for the Planet to once again ask people to share their powerful voices with the earth. I will, uh, I'll add one piece to that story and then we'll extend an invitation and, and we'll take some questions. Um, I'll, be, I'll be honest, um, Shannon graduated, every student you saw in that video graduated. And, uh, and I, as most professors, I go on and teach other classes. Um, um, when, Amanda, when Amanda in January came and spoke at the inauguration, um, she obviously, as you guys know, inspired a whole nation. Uh, her voice was magic. And, um, and I went to my inbox and all of a sudden started receiving um, messages. Uh, I think one of the most beautiful ones was sent by a nine-year-old girl in Brooklyn that I shared with Tricia that, um, that is amazing and heartfelt and remarkable. Um, I started getting them from classes, a uh, fourth grade teacher who had heard about this. And I'm sure what Amanda had done is it sparked people and they had gone and they had found that she had started this and wanted to join in. And uh, Trisha and I, um, and Trisha and I were, were talking and just like her obligation to Lucas, um, I felt an obligation to all of those people that were responding. I felt an obligation to Shannon and uh, so the thought would be is how do we continue and how do we continue to turn up the volume and amplify the voices problem hasn't gone away uh, and so here's where here's where where you can can come in and then uh, and then we're going to bring sarah up and talk a little bit because i'd like to show her piece um, but what we're, what we're going to do those who know me as a teacher uh intergenerational um, teaching has always been a part of what I've done. Um, I have, uh, I mentioned the class I brought here years ago. My students have worked with the Senior Center in Iowa City. Um, I have invited seniors. I, uh, a couple of years ago, I, before the, uh, the pandemic, I went to the provost and asked for 50 seats so that seniors like you in our community could sit in the seats for free in my courses. Um, and listen to the people that I would bring with the idea that your voices would change the dynamic of a classroom. The questions you asked, and, and my only, my only uh, request was that you cared to be with somebody who was young, that you, that you wanted to add your wisdom to the mix. And, um, and so what's going to happen on July 22nd, uh, 2 o'clock to 3.30, is that um, in the spring art room, uh, there's going to be a Prop for the Planet workshop uh, where Jenny and Trisha are going to be here to help, but the idea will be to answer that prompt, that question uh, that Amanda posed, how would you answer it? If you were to speak uh, to uh, the generations that will follow you, if you were to speak on behalf of the planet, what would you say? Um, if Sarah, if you come up, uh, Sarah turned hers in today, and uh, it's, it's quite remarkable. This is, uh, this is Sarah's piece. Isn't that something? Yeah, I was gonna say, thank you. it's really, and, and, and Sarah, I, I actually ran it off for you if you didn't have a copy. Uh, but uh, if you could, there's a, uh, she wrote an accompanying, uh, 
accompany prose to go with it. And why don't you describe what you did and how you came up with this? Yeah, so, um, and I just want to ask, is, is anyone feeling inspired by all of this? I mean, I certainly am. I just, I just love the story of all of the, these two and the, and the students and the way that they're using the art um, to bypass, you know, there's a lot of facts and figures and science about, you know, climate change and environmental issues. And those, those things can kind of be overwhelming and I think scary. And when we can use the arts as a way to kind of bypass that and get more into appreciating the beauty and, you know, remembering why, what, we, what we've fallen in love with about our planet, I think inspires action in a more meaningful way. So, I mean, you all, I, I've shared my artwork with you. Um, this is a piece that I actually started after my husband died. It's called Earth Dancer. And um, just as a little bit of a joke, Earth Dancer refers to Richard's handle um, when we met on Match.com. So he was Earth Dancer, um, which I thought was really corny at the time, but I, I've grown to love it. And he was, he was just a, a lover of the earth. And walking in the woods was the place where he most felt at home. And he taught me a lot about um, trees and the shapes of leaves and how to identify spring flowers and, and the different uh, textures of the bark and all those kinds of things. So this is my, this is kind of my ode to Richard. It's called Earth Dancer. But I also think of the deer as a, a being that is also an earth dancer and the way that they dwell um, in the woods so peacefully and quietly. So this was already in the works when I started to work with Dave and Trisha and I, I was thinking, I didn't know what I wanted to do, and I still may do other things. I have other ideas about how I want to respond to the prompt. But this was the first thing that came out of my heart and my mind after hearing about it. And so when I wrote this poem, and I ain't no Amanda Gorman, um, I felt like it went with this piece of artwork because the poem is called Things Told to Me by the Dying. And some of these things I heard from Richard and some of these things I heard from a cottonwood tree, which was my very first experience of understanding the beauty and sacredness of nature. When I was six years old, walking through the woods with my dog, and I just remember hearing the sounds of those cottonwood leaves as they shimmer in the wind, and I had this, I had this whole body awareness that that was a very important sound and something that I was worth stopping and listening to. So this is kind of the two things I've learned from Richard and the cottonwood tree. So things told to me by the dying, Slow down, he said. Shh, you said, as your golden hearts stirred. Listen with dancing ears to the song of the trees. We cottonwoods have a story to tell. Don't try to be everywhere at once, he said. Stop, you said. Let your feet root to the earth. Stand in your bones while your knowing unfurls like a fern's leaf. This is important. Appreciate what is right in front of you, he said. Spend time at the water's edge, you said. Explore with your eyes, hands, and heart the brink where so many live and so many die. What can we stand together on, he asked. This sacred ground, you replied. Let us twine our roots in that secret economy and promise it's never too late to fall in love.
Wow. That's beautiful. That's really beautiful. I, I'm going to just say a few things and then I'll let uh, Trish wrap it up and we'll take some questions. I really loved what Sarah said because, um, because one of the things that Shannon struggled with uh, when she started this, initially the idea was to take all the statistics, all of the, the dire things that are going to happen, how little time we have, how the clock is running out, and, and, and spread that far and wide, you know, yell that the, the place is on fire. Um, it's, an, it's an instinct, but the truth is, is that uh, what research has shown us is that it has, it has a, a really not a very strong, a, a positive effect. It either turns people off or, or scares them. Um, the hope that she had, the hope that Amanda had, uh, was that what we would do is it would really be casting a message of hope, of bringing people together, that collectively, uh, we can we can make a difference. Human nature is interesting. Um, you know, if a bear were to come in this room, uh, our instinct would be to run from the bear as fast as we can, right? Um, and that's human instinct, but it's awfully hard to think about running from a bear 50 years from now. It becomes very difficult for us to think about that. I, I want to share with you, if, if, if um, if you enjoyed this, and especially if you look at a beautiful work like Sarah's and you say, you know, boy, uh, I don't know if I can do this. I want to I wanna, I wanna share with you a couple of what I would call the, the kind of roadblocks that have, um, that have kept my students from participating and how I've tried to diffuse them. These are the three things that my students will say. The first one is, you know, this is wonderful, but I don't have anything important to say. Um, you know, what, what could I add to that conversation? What profound thing could I do that could change this? And uh, the argument that I would make, uh, the argument that Shannon would make, Lucas would make, Amanda would make, is, is it's not about any of us having this, this you know, prophetic, um, you know, wonderful kind of change the world a singular assignment, but it's the mosaic of us all doing it together. Uh, the, the next one will be that it, it doesn't matter, um, you know, uh, which is kind of an argument that uh, we have when we go to vote. You know, just what is one person, one, one, one drawing, one poem going to do? And, and you know, I, I would argue strongly about, again, the collective nature of us working together. And, and then the final one, um, which is, I was, I was actually an art major in college. Um, you know, this is one I, I was fortunate to, to fall on the side of, of somebody that was continuing to make art. But, um, but I know it to be true, and that is the idea of, I, I'm not an artist. You know, I'm not an artist. This is gorgeous. Wait till you see the crazy thing I'll make. And, um, and, and you know, Sarah, I'm going to bring you back up here, if you don't mind, because Sarah... Sarah said something in one of our meetings as we were preparing, and it was a, it was a really kind of a wonderful, wonderful way of phrasing it that I'd like her to describe, which is the notion of art wounds. Think about the uh, preschoolers and that Trish had and how they approach this and, and how you might be in your mind thinking. And Sarah, how would you describe the art wounds? Well, one of the things that we were talking about is we were hoping to inspire people to, you know, create a response to Amanda's prompt was, how many people feel like they're not creative? Like, oh, I can't draw, or, you know, I mean, that's just a, another instinct, and I think um, many of us have what's called like an artist wound, where somewhere along the line, somebody might have made us feel like we didn't color in the lines good enough, or something, you know? Um, so, trying to, um, help people get over that hump and just, and that's what's so wonderful. I always say the best art education I got was working with the preschoolers because they are so free with their creations and, and they're not, they don't, there's nothing um, precious about, it's like, I'll, I'll make Kennedy's, you know, and I'll, I just like the way these colors are mixing together and I'm going to rip that page off and start over. So. I just want to encourage people to kind of bypass, if they've got an artist wound, people have singing wounds too, you 
know, you, people would think, I, I can't, I don't sing. Um, to just bypass that and, and dwell more in the questions, um, getting in touch with that first nature experience and, and just creating a collage or uh, a written thing or something from, from that feeling. Um, and if you do that, it, 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 will, it, won't, it can't help but have an impact. Does that make sense? Okay. Well, I'm going to let Trish close it out, and uh, then we'll take some questions from you. Yeah, so if you go to my preschool class and say, um, who in here is an artist, I will guarantee you every single child will raise their hand. But we talked about walking in here and asking you all, who is an artist? Would you raise your hand? Maybe not, maybe there'd be a few of you. Um, so we're asking you to get that preschool spirit. When Shannon came for that COPO meeting and asked for their help, they all said, yes, I will help you. Um, so before we start the questions, I just wanna thank you so, so much for coming here tonight. I'm here tonight because of Lucas, and um, that's why I'm here, but I need your help. Your generation is at the opposite end of Lucas's. You have strength and wisdom and resilience and a lifetime of experiences that can help us get through this. And you have powerful voices. Just like those preschoolers and just like the college students, your voice is powerful and we need to hear your voice now more than ever. So I hope that you will consider coming to the workshop and sharing your powerful voices with the earth um, on July 22nd. I will be there and I am determined to make my own response. I would say I'm not an artist, but I'm not gonna say that because we can all be artists, right? Um, I don't have an artistic background, but I will bring and share with you my response and it is not going to look like Sarah's, I will guarantee that, um, but I'm gonna do it anyway. So I hope that you'll join us and um, I think we can just open it up for questions, discussion. That's, that sounds yeah. great. Does anyone have any questions for us? Questions or comments? Comments. Ideas? I'll come around with the microphone. Hi. Well, I was one of those that you invited the community to come for the green room in the oh. um, Angler. I came for two years. And I really thought it was great, and I'm just wondering if you're going to do that again. Thank you. I, I, I'm, I, I'm going to do something. The pandemic um, really kind of threw it back, and um, I, you know, I, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, um, I was uh, 20 minutes into a class of, uh, that was going to be leading into the green room when my phone lit up. And, uh, and I found out the university was going to be going all online, and um, and I spent my I spent uh, my my students were scattered. It was a very scary time. The kind of thing we're talking about, and I um, I started writing essays and telling them stories, and I would send them mail, uh, which was kind of an interesting thing to do. Um, I knew we wouldn't be back in the fall, and so I created some things online. I'm going to do two experiences uh, this, uh, this fall. Um, one of them, Lindsay will probably enjoy. Uh, I'm working with the old uh, Therapeutic Recreation Department and bringing a woman named Judy Hyman in. And Judy Hyman, if you're, do you, do you know who that is, Lindsay? Uh, Judy, Judy Hyman um, is kind of the, you, 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 I saw a hand raised, kind of, kind of Gloria Steinem of disabilities uh, activists. Um, you know, she, uh, and she uh, is 72, 73 years old, uh, got polio when she, was, um, when she was 18 months old, uh, largely a quadriplegic, and has uh, been one of the, the strong voices uh, to, um, to, uh, to actually bring, um, to bring that awareness in our country. We'll probably have that, though, at Hampshire, because the Angler Theater um, is, not, uh, is not accessible for, for disabilities in, in a way that would do that. So I'm going to be doing some, uh, keep your eyes uh, peeled. Uh, we'll have two in the fall, and, uh, and then I'm going to be doing something new in the spring. So, so thank you.
thank you for and thank you for coming. Who is your favorite, just out of curiosity? I like them all, but Jane Elliott was very interesting to me because I hadn't heard of her, and all the kids had definitely heard of her, and, and that one was Pat. So I think that was the most. Thank you. For those of you who don't know who Jane Elliott, if you remember the kind of brown-eyed, blue-eyed study. Uh, that they did. That's uh, that's Jane Elliott, and has been fighting for racial justice ever since. And and she lives in Iowa. She everyone came for nothing. They came for nothing, and she drove out with her daughter to uh, to be there that night. So thank you for bringing that up. Any other questions? Anybody? <laughs> I think this has just been amazing, amazingly wonderful, but you really sent a jolt into my life. Um, because I've been working on a project of my own. It kind of goes along with this, but it's from a completely different angle. And I'm in despair right at the moment because I don't know how to move ahead with it because it's coming from a different angle. I've been thinking a lot lately that those young people you've worked with when they're 50 years. I have a list of the cities that will not be here or that will have been flooded, and they are. Atlanta, Key West, Miami, Seattle, St. Petersburg, Tybee Island, Georgia, parts of Charleston, South Carolina, and Los Angeles. So I've been focused on global warming in, my, in trying to what I do with my work, with my art. And your comments that it was, I mean, you just told me that won't work. You did, you just told me that won't work. Yeah. And I know we need to talk about that, but I love what you did and what you did with the children is so wonderful. But I'm just sort of struggling right now. Well, I, I didn't mean to. I, we need all but, the different voices. But um, no, I know, but, but I was not tuned in to where you were going. This is so beautiful and so wonderful. And that little boy just, yeah. It's so amazing. Okay, I can't tell you how much I appreciate tonight. But yeah. I'm still, I've been working on the places that disappeared in those, in 2018, 2019, you know, from Sudan and from the southwest coast of India and those refugees that I was trying to feed above them with ants coming into the water, falling into the water. And I felt like, oh, I don't belong here. I'm, I'm being too negative. But when those children are 50 years old, those cities will be much smaller. Yeah. And I think that is what's touching you right now and is driving you and motivating you. I have goosebumps just listening to you. Um, I have a daughter who is 23, and she worries about these things. Um, Dave has talked to students, and I know my daughter has talked about, should I even bring children into this world right now? Um, so. So I don't mean to, I don't think we mean to gloss over the very scary and sad things. Um, my children's, the preschoolers' responses are hopeful and joyful and they're wonderful. But Dave, we could maybe speak to the things that your students, how they respond. Some things are not so joyful because they're, they're afraid. I want those children to be joyful. I don't. Yes, you know. no, we do too. We do too. Uh, the, the truth is that um, if you were to look at the work of my students, my students are responding the same way you are. Um, they're responding in fear. They're responding in, I, you, I've been dealt a horrible hand. Um, and I, I met with a student literally a week ago, and, and she said that because climate change is what she's, um, she is concerned about. And she said, it's going to strike. My life will be different when I'm, and she's a freshman right now. She will be in middle through law school. And she goes, when that happens, you know, my life, my life won't be beginning the way I want it to. Um, there needs to be work on all fronts. And, um, and, you know, and there are pieces in the collection that we have that are like yours. And, you know, and I, I think there's different kinds of people. My, I hear that, and it's and and I hear those statistics, and it's like when when I, the house is on fire and I'm grabbing a bucket, 
Um, but as I mentioned, I think unfortunately, when you look at the masses, we've been unable to, that, that statistics, that science, has been unable to, to move the hearts and minds of people to do what they need to do. And, and, and that's why trying to use art and the beauty. And when I asked you the question about thinking of a time in the natural world that, um, that was memorable to you, that's really, I mean, so many, so many of my students don't experience that anymore. Um, the, to be in, to, out with nature, to spend the night, to, you know, to actually experience that. And so there's so many opportunities. But, but no, as Trish said, our, our interest was not uh, to, I mean, there's many pathways to, to get there. So I'm really interested in your work now, and I'm thinking, what what are those towns? What are what are they? Those cities? What are, what would they say? What where is their voice as they're disappearing? Or you talked about the waters rising. What what are, what would the water sound like? What would it feel like to the you know the people in that city? Um, so I think your work, what you're working on, is going to be amazing, and I can't wait to see it. it it's, we owe those lovely children. But that's exactly right. It sort of brings me to the um, what my daughter said. My daughter um, worked with us to kind of launch this project, and we were in a meeting with, with my 23-year-old, and she said to us, kind of after we talked for almost two hours, she said, okay, that's great, collecting art is great, but then what? What are you going to do? And we're not sure yet, but we want to do something with all of this art that comes in. Um, we hope it inspires, like Sarah said, art will inspire people's souls, whereas statistics might numb our brains. So we hope to inspire people into action. Um, all of the art will be documented and archived for people to go to and see. And we hope that we get hundreds and thousands of pieces and we can do even more with, with all of the voices that have been shared and that we can somehow use that in a way to inspire action. Thank you for having us. This yeah. was a real honor to be here with you. So thank you. Thanks.